I sort of assumed the Shannon would. The Shannon never came. No. Mm -hmm. no. I just figured she's, you know, the division director, and she's always here. Uh, well, I can do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're Procedure is for the um, student to present, for then the uh, public to ask any questions, then the public is dismissed, and this committee remains behind and asks any further questions, and then he's dismissed, then the committee decides whether he has successfully defended his thesis. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, today I will be presenting my uh, thesis on the effects of. Um, parsimony logic and extended parsimony clustering in protein identification and quantification in shock and proteomics. So, what is proteomics? Oh, sorry. Uh, what is proteomics? Uh, the term proteomics was uh, coined in the mid 1990s to loosely describe the large scale characterization of all the proteins that are expressed in a cell or in a biological sample. And uh, mass spectrometry is the predominant tool that is used in uh, proteomics. So the term mass spectrometry-based proteomics is the, uh, the use of technical advancements in uh, mass spectrometry instrumentation and the availability of large uh, databases to uh, not only uh, not only large-scale characterization, but also for functional analysis such as post transcription modifications and protein protein interactions, and uh, also for structural uh, uh, analysis. And uh, shotgun proteomics is the predominant methodology that is used, and this is where uh, a protein sample is digested into a subtype, and that un uh, undergoes a mass spectrometry analysis for uh, protein characterization. So um, let me uh, briefly walk you through a, a typical shock and proteomics experiment. It can be uh, divided into uh, three parts. First part is a sample preparation. This is where a uh, sample is first digested into uh, peptides using the enzymes like uh, trypsin or chymotrypsin. And then uh, that peptide mixture is then subjected to, uh, or it's separated using the liquid chromatography system. And the second part is the uh, peptide sequencing using mass spectrometry. This is where the peptides elute from the, uh, the liquid chromatography system. They're then ionized using uh, electron spray, and the ionized peptides are then subjected to the uh, mass spectrometry or tandem mass spectrometry, which uh, results in this uh, fragmented ion spectrum 
that is used for uh, peptide identification. And uh, the last part is peptide identification, where the statewide uh, spectrum is compared against the theoretical uh, spectrum that is generated from the sequence databases, and the peptide that best matches the spectrum is identified. So if we go a little more exactly into the, uh, the peptide identification uh, part, uh, what you have are these protein uh, sequence databases, uh, which are basically large repositories of protein sequences you know, for a given species. And these are like the, the NCBR database or the, the Uniprot database. And uh, these guys undergo an in silico uh, digestion using an enzyme of, uh, of interest, like a trypsin digestion. And that generates uh, this peptide mixture, which would be a search space for uh, peptide identifications. And uh, based on the, the measured mass of the peptides, uh, a theoretical uh, fragmented ion spectrum is generated. And then, the, and then you have these search agents like the sequest or the mass plot. These are used to uh, compare the acquired spectrum to the theoretical spectrum. And then a candidate list of uh, peptides are all identified uh, for that spectrum. And these candidate, peptide, uh, these candidate peptides are then ranked according to a scoring function. And generally, the, the highest scoring peptide is considered the best match for the spectrum. And so this spectrum is called the, the peptide spectral match, or the PSM. So <clears throat> and this is how all the, the, the peptides are identified. And uh, once the peptides are identified, the next step is to infer proteins based on the observed peptides. And this could be a challenging process in uh, shotgun proteomics, because upon digestion, you, um, you, uh, there's a loss of connection between proteins and peptides. Um, you generate two kinds of uh, peptides. You have the unique peptides, and these are peptides that are mapped to a single protein. So for instance, this uh, peptides four and five are only linked to protein four. So these are unique peptides because they only tell you about a single uh, protein in the sample. And then you can also have shared peptides, and these are peptides that can be mapped to multiple proteins. So they create ambiguities in determining their parent group. So for instance, these the peptides one and two. If I could find my other oh, list, uh, peptides one and two are shared peptides, <coughs> and they're linked to both proteins one and two. So if you see peptides one and two in your sample, it's hard to tell if they belong to protein one or protein two. And these are called shared peptides. And it's because of the shared peptides, uh, protein inference can be a complicated task. And uh, you cannot really ignore the shared peptide information because there's that's a potential loss of information. So what I have here are two common scenarios of uh, protein inference. And uh, the, again, uh, just to make sure that you guys know that in, in protein inference, proteins are inferred based on the observed peptides. So in the first scenario here, you've observed five peptides, one, two, three, four, and five. And peptides one and four and five are unique peptides, meaning that they're only linked to a single protein. So in this case, peptide one is linked to protein A, and peptides four and five are linked to protein B. And peptides two and three are shared peptides, again, meaning they're linked to both protein A and protein B. So this is an example of a distinguishable protein, because each protein can be represented by a distinct set of peptides. So in your protein inference report, you report them as distinguishable proteins, and you report protein A and protein B. Now you can also have an indistinguishable proteins, and these are proteins, or a group of, uh, these are a group of proteins that are uh, represented by an identical set of peptides. So in this example, we have six, seven, eight, and nine peptides, and this, these four peptides can be linked to both protein C and protein D. So you're really not sure if your sample contains C or D. So what you do in your protein inference is you report them as an indistinguishable group that contains both protein C and protein D. So the main, um, the main idea behind uh, protein inference is to generate a parsimonious list of proteins or, or a minimum list of proteins that account for all the observed peptides. So one common basic parsimony logic is to uh, remove proteins that are subsets of other proteins. And uh, for instance, here in the third scenario, I have peptides 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And all these five peptides are linked to protein E. And then you have peptides 1 and 2 that are linked to protein F. And 3, 4, and 5 are linked to protein G. And because we wanted to generate a minimal list of proteins that account for all the peptides, we would only report protein E in the final protein principle. And F and G are considered subsets of protein and they're discarded of the uh, protein inference report. 
So <clears throat> what causes this peptide degeneracy in shotgun proteomics? Um, one major source of peptide degeneracy is the underlying genomic structure of organisms, and particularly the higher eukaryotic organisms or humans. Um, they, they have these, they undergo these modifications, such as the SNPs or the RNA editing or alternate splicing, and other post-translational modifications, such as uh, yeah, other post-translational modifications that can yield similar protein products. And because of that, a peptide can be matched to multiple proteins, and that could cause uh, peptide degeneracy. Uh, another reason is because of the differences in the choice of protein sequence databases that are used in uh, peptide identifications. And uh, in proteomics, there are several uh, sequence databases that are used, like the NCBI or the, or the Ensemble or the IPI, or not IPI anymore, but uh, Unipro databases um, that vary in uh, completeness and uh, redundancy. So depending on the, uh, so basically, the, the protein database choice, it is possible that a peptide can be matched to multiple proteins. So, <clears throat> um, in my uh, presentation, or in my thesis, I have accomplished uh, four goals that I will be presenting today. The first goal is to understand if the protein sequence databases from different sources are actually different. So what I'm looking at are uh, protein and peptide level differences uh, across uh, databases. And, and at the same time, I want to compare and contrast these differences uh, between higher eukaryotic organisms and the lower eukaryotic organisms. So for higher eukaryotes, I chose um, human and mice, and for lower eukaryotes, it's yeast, to understand the effects of uh, genomic complexity in these organisms. And uh, the second uh, goal that, uh, is to understand the effects of protein sequence databases from different sources on uh, real biological samples. And uh, this is where we wanted to assess differences in protein level characteristics, such as uh, distinguishable and non-distinguishable protein counts, and also peptide level characteristics such as uh, shade and unique peptide counts. And um, <clears throat> the question of interest here is, does the cluster, uh, sorry, does the basic parsimony logic that is used in this protein inference process uh, produce protein counts that are independent of the protein sequence databases? Because the number of proteins that are identifiable in a sample is an intrinsic property of the sample, so it should only depend on the sample and should be relatively independent of the uh, protein sequence databases. So uh, the third goal here is then to understand uh, we are going to implement these clustering algorithms, which are in a sense an extension to the uh, basic parsimony logic. And we wanted to see how these extended parsimony clustering changes the effects of protein sequence databases on protein and peptide characteristics. And uh, we've implemented two different uh, variations of the uh, protein, uh, of these clustering algorithms. And what they do is they're, they're implemented after the protein inference logic. So they use the parsimonious list of proteins. And we group, and, and the way they work is they group proteins with high shared peptide evidence and uh, low unique peptide evidence. So the question of interest here again is, does this extended parsimony clustering produce protein counts that are independent of the protein sequence databases. And finally, the last goal is to then to understand how the quantitative information changes with uh, respect to the changing protein context. And throughout my presentation, you'll see how the definition of unique and shared peptides change with respect to the uh, basic parsimony logic and also with respect to the extended parsimony clustering. So we've computed this metric called the, the QYC, or the quantitative information content, which is the, the ratio of the unique PSMs out of the, uh, all the identifiable PSMs. And what we wanted to see is the, we want to explore the dependence of QYC on the choice of protein sequence database and uh, uh, basic parsimony logic and extreme parsimony clustering. So <clears throat> before I, I move on, um, I wanted to go over definitions of some of the terms that I'll be using in this presentation. Uh, like I told you, the distinguishable proteins in protein inference, there are proteins that are represented by uh, a distinct set of peptides. And then indistinguishable proteins are those that are represented by an identical set of peptides. And we have shared peptides, which are mapped, or peptides that are mapped to a single protein, or multiple proteins. And then unique peptides are those that are mapped to a single protein or a protein inclusive. So uh, the first thing we now look at is the uh, protein and peptide characteristics from uh, sequence databases. And uh, we've chosen uh, four sequence data, uh, we've chosen sequence databases from uh, four sources for uh, human, mouse, and yeast. And my presentation today, I'll only be comparing human and yeast, by the way. And uh, so we have a Uniprot database that contains uh, the Swiss Prot, which is a, a manually curated uh, and highly annotated database. And then you have the Tremble, 
which has uh, automatic uh, annotations of protein sequences. It's not, uh, it doesn't have a high, as high, of, high level of a curation and annotation as the SysRa database. And then we finally have the, the isoforms database. These are basic, this is basically an additional database that contains uh, separate records of all the uh, splice variants for a protein in a given species. And in addition to Uniprot, we also chose the NCBI RefSeq database, the Ensemble database, and the IPI database, although IPI is not currently used anymore. And uh, please note that the yeast doesn't have an IPI database. So once we obtain all these uh, uh, databases, uh, we then implemented Python scripts to obtain the non redundant protein counts. Uh, non uh, so what we've done was bring all the, the duplicate sequences in those databases. And um, so that there's only a single record of 100% uh, identical full length sequence for a given protein in a given species. Those would be the longer than protein counts. <coughs> and then we also performed an in silico triptic digestion and uh, computed the peptide characteristics. So we looked at the shade and uh, unique peptide counts in these uh, protein sequence databases. Again, the goal here is to compare uh, between uh, different. Uh, data, uh, different uh, sequence databases and also contrast between higher and uh, lower eukaryotic organisms. So, <clears throat> if you look at the protein characteristics across sequence databases, um, what I have here is the relative non redundant protein count between uh, human sequence databases and the yeast sequence databases. And uh, by the way, these are uh, relative counts um, to the Uniproc reference proteome, which is um, uh, indicated by an asterisk for each species. And what we found was that there is a high variability in the protein counts across human sequence databases. Uh, in fact, um, larger databases such as the Swiss plot and the Tremble, and the Swiss plot and the Tremble with the isoforms database has almost twice as many proteins as the, the Uniprot reference group. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have these smaller databases such as the, the Swiss plot database that has only about um, one third as many proteins as the Uniprot reference group. And if you look at the actual non redundant counts, um, you notice how the Swiss plot database has only about 20,000 proteins, while the, when you add the addition of, um, when you add the Tremble database, you, uh, the number of counts go sixfold. And the addition of the isoforms database adds another 20,000 proteins. So again, the point is that there's a lot of variability in the uh, protein counts across different protein sequence databases. However, when you look at the yeast databases, you don't see that kind of variability across protein counts. All the, you know, the yeast is a very well studied protein. There's a very good communication between um, different uh, yeast sequence databases. Oh. <clears throat> and now when we look at the peptide characteristics across sequence databases, and it's also important to look at the peptide characteristics because Sharpen uh, proteomics has a, a peptide-centric approach to it. So the, uh, the gray bars, the, the, the darker gray bars here are the, the total peptide counts across uh, human sequence databases, and the, the lighter gray are those for, uh, across yeast sequence databases. So the obvious difference is that there are a lot more uh, peptide counts across uh, human databases compared to the yeast. And uh, something more interesting is that there's, again, a lot of variability in these uh, peptide counts across human databases. You know, you have the, the Swiss plot database that has uh, approximately 2.4 million uh, peptide sequences, while a larger database has a little over 3 million uh, peptide sequences. Uh, however, there is no such variability um, in the yeast protein sequence peptides. They're all right around 600,000 peptides. They're all right around 600,000 peptides. Um, <clears throat> and we've also looked at the shared peptide proportions. And uh, uh, so the, the black circles that you see here are the shared peptide proportions in the, ye on, in the human sequence databases. And the white circles are those in the yeast sequence databases. And uh, the obvious difference is that uh, in, we found that on average, uh, there are the, the shared peptide proportions in human sequence databases is about 53% compared to only uh, about 2% in the yeast sequence databases. It's kind of, that kind of tells you about the, the genomic complexity that's present in the human sequences compared to the yeast sequences. And also, again, there's a lot of uh, variability in the shared peptide proportions across human sequence databases. When you look at the Swiss plot, it has only about 2.7% um, shape of high proportion, uh, which is very similar to what we observe in uh, in the yeast sequence databases. And it tells you about there's there's a very low redundancy in the Swiss plot database uh, compared to the other you know the much larger ones like the Swiss plot in the database, which are over you know, close to 60 percent 
shape of other portions. <coughs> so, so far I've showed you that um, there are protein and peptide level differences in uh, protein, sorry, in different uh, human protein sequence tattoos. So what we wanted to see now is if those peptide and, or protein and peptide tattoos characteristics <coughs> exist in uh, real biological samples. Because real biological samples only contain a small proportion of uh, proteins that you would observe in uh, in uh, protein sequence databases. And, uh, <clears throat> and also there, there's differences in protein abundances in uh, real biological samples. So a low abundance protein is only identified by a small number of peptides. And because proteins are inferred based on the observed peptides, uh, you know, this could either attenuate or mitigate the, the effects that you would see from protein sequence databases. So what we wanted to know is if the protein and peptide characteristics are actually similar in real biological samples, as we've observed in protein or in, in real protein sequence databases. So um, what we've done was we obtained the raw mass spectrometry data um, from publicly available data sets of human plasma cells, uh, mouse secret culture cells, and yeast wholesale lysates. And then we've uh, searched those against different species specific uh, sequence databases that I've showed you in the previous slide. And uh, then we have implemented this protein inference with the basic parsimony logic. So we've removed any kind of subsets, protein subset, to generate a final parsimonious list of uh, proteins within our biological samples across different databases. From that, we were then able to compute protein characteristics such as the, the, the distinguishable and the indistinguishable protein counts. And at the same time, we have also uh, computed peptide characteristics from mass spectrometry data that were uh, peptide characteristics like the, the shade and uh, the unique peptide counts. So, <clears throat> so if you look at the, the relative uh, total protein counts in real biological samples, so this is, this is uh, the relative protein counts in human and yeast samples across different databases. Again, it's a very similar uh, uh, figure to what I've shown you previously. Uh, what we found was that, again, there's a lot of variability in the number of proteins that are identified uh, across different protein sequence databases. When we search our samples against larger databases like the Swiss Prot and the Tremble, or the Swiss Prot and the Tremble with the isoform database, we found almost twice as many proteins in our sample as when searched against the, the Unicrot reference protein. And again, on the other the spectrum, you know, when searched against the smaller database, we only found about 70% of the proteins that we found in the Unicrot reference protein. However, uh, we found no such differences in yeast samples across different uh, databases. So again, it tells you about uh, how these um, protein sequences can be different with human compared to yeast. And uh, when we look at the uh, distinguishable protein proportions in uh, real biological samples, um, <clears throat> the lighter gray bars here indicate the, the distinguishable protein proportions in the, in the yeast samples across databases. And as you see, there are 99, over 99% of the proteins are distinguishable proteins in the yeast samples, and there's no, no very good. They're all pretty much exactly the same across different uh, databases. However, only 70% of the proteins are uh, distinguishable proteins in the human samples across different databases, and there appears to be a lot of variability. Uh, across databases, and and, um, and you know you have the smaller database like the Swiss Prot database that has over 98 percent distinguishable uh, proteins, or where we identified over 98 percent distinguishable proteins, compared to a much larger database like the Swiss Prot and uh, Tremble, where we only observe about 60 percent uh, distinguishable protein proportions. Right. So this, yes. What's your definition of a distinguishable protein? These are proteins that are represented by a distinct set of peptides. Uh, unlike the indistinguishable, where they're uh, identified by, I'm sorry. Where they're ambiguous. Ambiguous, right. They're, they're if you were able to collapse multiple proteins into a single group, right. you called CD, I think you called it in your earlier slide, uh, if would that be disti a distinguishable protein, or would it be eliminated from? No, so, so, so the, when you're looking for the distinguishable <clears throat> protein counts, you're looking at the way this computer is all the in, so you have only one single count representing all the group or all the proteins in an indistinguishable protein group. So if you have ten proteins within an indistinguishable uh, protein set, that would be considered as one just non redundant protein count. Okay. So that's how. Thanks. Um, no, um, so again, so what we see is that 
there's a, a, a there's a lot of variation in the in the, in the uh, sort of, we see that there the the human uh, samples are a lot more complex than the yeast samples, and also that there's uh, a lot of variation the the redundancies in the human sequence statics compared to the, pro, uh, the yeast sequence statics. So and now when we look at the peptide characteristics in uh, the real biological samples, uh, <clears throat> what we notice is that the trends are very uh, similar to what we've observed with, from the in silico digestions of the protein uh, sequence databases. Uh, the, the darker gray bars here are the, the shared peptide proportions with the human samples across uh, human databases, and the lighter gray are those for the yeast samples across databases. And what you notice is that the, the shared peptide proportions, or the mean shared peptide proportions in the, in the real uh, human samples is about 30.5% across all databases. While for yeast, it's only around 2.8%. Again, that's an indication of the differences in the complexity within these organisms. And again, high or larger uh, protein databases have much higher share of peptide proportions for the, the human uh, sequence databases compared to the, the much smaller ones. <clears throat> so, um, so what, what I've shown you so far is that you know there are protein and peptide level differences even in real biological samples, uh, especially in the human samples across uh, different databases. And you know when we searched our sample against larger database, we found uh, we've identified more proteins within our sample compared to when they were uh, searched against a smaller database. But in reality, a sample consists of a, a set number of proteins, and the number of proteins that are present in the sample should only be dependent on the sample and should be, again, relatively independent of the protein sequence database. And during our entire process in Python, what we've done is we've used the same sample, so the number of proteins would be set number of proteins, and but we've searched them against different protein sequence databases. And we have implemented a protein inference with the basic parse money logic, so we remove any protein subsets. And what we found is that there were a variable number of uh, protein counts across different databases, which shouldn't really happen. Um, and with the advancements in the mass spectrometry instrumentation, you know, more peptides are being identified now, and so the data sets are actually growing in size. And what I've shown you that, you know, the basic parsimony logic, you're actually observing a variable number of uh, identical or variable number of proteins with the same sample. Uh, it probably suggests that you know, perhaps that the basic parsimony logic isn't sufficient enough, and that there needs to be an extension to this uh, existing logic. And for that reason, to overcome those shortcomings, what we've done was we've implemented a clustering algorithm, uh, which are, in a sense, an extension to the uh, existing parsimony logic. And like I mentioned earlier, these algorithms group proteins that are, group, sorry, um, group proteins that have um, high shape peptide evidence and low unique peptide evidence. So we wanted to see how when, uh, when we apply these, this extended parsimony clustering, you know, how it would affect uh, protein and peptide characteristics across sequence databases. So the first one we've done was um, implement and test the PAR clustering algorithm um, on real biological samples. And uh, the PAR clustering algorithm is actually part of the, the pipeline that is used in the OHC proteomics work. And, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the clustering algorithm is implemented after the protein inference uh, process with the basic parsimony logic. So it makes use of the, the protein and the, the, the peptide reports that are generated from the protein inference. And it performs a, a pairwise comparison of uh, proteins that share at least a peptide uh, to test for clustering. And based on the unique and uh, shared peptide spectral counts, there are three ways that uh, a pair of proteins can be clustered. You can have pseudo-redundant clusters. So in pseudo-redundant clusters, uh, by the way, the, the red boxes here indicate uh, unique peptides, and the green boxes are the, are the shared peptides. So in pseudo-redundant clusters, uh, if the two proteins have low unique peptide evidence, so they have a maximum of two spectral counts, but their uh, shared uh, peptide spectral counts is at least 10 times the unique peptide, then the two proteins are clustered together as the pseudo determinant clusters. Again, the logic here is that if this unique peptide evidence had not existed, then the two proteins would have been considered an indistinguishable um, protein group based on the, the basic parsimony logic. And then you can also have pseudo subset clusters, and in this, um, 
if one protein has a really small unique peptide area, so a maximum of two spectral counts, but has a significantly shared peptide evidence, so at least 10 times the, uh, the unique peptide evidence, then, the, then, then this protein would be considered as a pseudo subset of the other protein. Again, the logic here is that if this unique peptide evidence had not existed, then um, this protein would have been considered uh, a true subset and it would not have been reported in the, the protein inference process or by the basic parsimony logic. And then finally, you have shared spectral clusters, and this is where um, if two proteins have a, a significantly large shared peptide evidence uh, compared to the unique peptide evidence, then they're clustered together. So if their shared spectral counts is at least 40 times the, uh, the, unique, or the unique peptide count, then it's uh, clustered together as shared spectral clusters. And whenever a pair of uh, proteins are clustered together, they're, uh, they're um, present in a single entry, and the unique and shared peptide counts are computed again. And this is uh, this iteration kind of goes until there's a stable number of entries that are obtained. So um, we've then performed uh, protein and peptide, uh, or we've then looked into protein and peptide characteristics in human samples with, uh, um, <clears throat> with uh, the clock clustering algorithm. So, what we see here in this figure is the human distinguished there you go. Oh, there you go. The, the human distinguishable protein counts uh, in human samples across all databases. And the black circles here are the protein counts after the basic parsimony logic, and the white circles are after the PA uh, clustering algorithm. And the the obvious thing that we notice is that upon the PA, upon implementing the, the PA clustering algorithm, there is a decrease in variability in the distinguishable protein counts across all databases. So this is evidence showing that you know we've negated the effects of the protein sequence database um, on protein counts uh, upon clustering. In fact, what we noticed was that the the uh, variation in the protein counts has dropped from 60% with the basic parsimony logic to only 5% uh, when we implemented the clock clustering algorithm. And uh, now when we look at the, the, the effects of pop algorithm on peptides, uh, the black, again, the black circles here indicate the shared peptide proportions in the human samples across all databases with the basic parsimony logic. And the white circles are when uh, the pop algorithm was implemented. And what we noticed was that the shared peptide proportions has significantly gone down across all the databases with the pop algorithm. And not only that, but the variability um, across the databases has also gone down with the uh, the pop And something to note here is that the the Swiss uh, database with the uh, bar basic parsimony logic has a very <coughs> low shared peptide proportion to start with, and that's slightly gone down on uh, pop um, <clears throat> But Another thing to note here is the definition of shared peptides, uh, how it changes with the context. Um, in basic parsimony logic, shared peptides are with respect to the, the parsimonious list of proteins. So they're with respect to the, the distinguishable proteins or the indistinguishable protein groups. And now when you introduce this in, uh, the clustering or the <coughs> parsimony clustering algorithm, now they're with respect to clusters of proteins that are generated. So um, all these protein because then when a lot of proteins are clustered together, all their shared peptides will be now be considered as unique peptides with respect to clusters. So that sort of lowers the the, um, the shared peptide proportions and also increases the unique peptide proportions, which we will later use for quantification purposes. Um, in addition to uh, um, in addition to the the pop clustering algorithm, we also wanted to look at other clustering algorithms that are present in the literature and uh, compare them to the pop clustering algorithm. And to our surprise, we could only find one publication by the makers of the mascot, and there was another software technical manual by the makers of uh, Scaffold. And so the example that they've provided in the technical manual, we were then able to code uh, an independent version of the scaffold uh, clustering algorithm. And um, <clears throat> again, this, this algorithm is very similar uh, to the pop clustering algorithm. It's, it's actually implemented, again, after the 
the protein inference logic. And what it does is it performs a pairwise comparison of proteins that uh, share peptides to test for clustering. And unlike the pop clustering algorithm, the, the clustering criterion is pretty simple. If two proteins, uh, two proteins are clustered, if they share at least 50% of their peptides. So it's a, it's a, it's a very straight up uh, method of clustering. And every additional protein is uh, iteratively added to an existing cluster if that protein shares at least 50% of its peptides with uh, proteins in a, within a cluster. Um, so what we found, again, when we look at the, the protein and peptide characteristics uh, in human samples with the scaffold and clustering, very similar results to uh, what we've observed in the clustering algorithm. Again, the white circles here uh, represent the distinguishable protein counts after implementing the scaffold and clustering. There is a significant reduction in the variability in the uh, protein counts across databases. In fact, what we noticed was the, uh, the variability has dropped from 68% of the, the basic parsimony budget to only 0.9% of the scaffold values. Um, again, this is another strong evidence that the extended parsimony clustering has actually negated the uh, effects of the protein sequence databases um, in, in uh, protein counts. And now when we look at the shared uh, peptide proportions after implementing the the scaffold like clustering, what we found was that the, the, that the main shared peptide proportions uh, has dropped from 13.5% uh, with the basic parsimony logic to only 1.1% uh, with the scaffold like clustering. Again, there's a very good consistency across uh, databases with the scaffold like clustering. <clears throat> so now that we have implemented these uh, clustering algorithms, we also wanted to uh, understand if the clusters that are generated from these algorithms have some kind of a biological meaning to them. And uh, you know, instead of these clusters uh, generated from just the peptide evidence, more than enough, there's no more functional or biological similarity. And so we've looked at some internal cluster evaluation. And uh, for that, for the internal cl uh, cluster evaluation, we've uh, measured the, the silhouette score of those clusters. And uh, the silhouette score is a, it's, it's a simple computation that measures the, the consistency within clusters of data. So for each protein I, the silhouette score of that protein is the, <clears throat> it, uh, it's a measure of how similar that protein is with members of its own cluster compared to how separated that protein is um, members or with, with its closest neighboring cluster. So it's, it's in a way a comparison of um, uh, cohesion to separation. And uh, what we've done was we've performed uh, a global pairwise alignment of all the proteins that are present within a, uh, that are present in a cluster size of two or more. And from that we were able to compute the similarity scores for all pairs of uh, proteins within a cluster. And from the similarity scores, we were then able to compute a dissimilarity score, which is one minus similarity score. And then we've used that dissimilarity score as a distance metric for the silhouette score computation. And then we were then able to compute the mean silhouette scores for uh, all the clusters that were generated by either the PAW or the SCAP or like algorithms. And that kind of gives you the measure of how tightly grouped the data of these clusters are. And, uh, Something to note here is that the, the silhouette score ranges from negative one to positive one. So the higher the value, the more evidence uh, to suggest that the uh, protein is associated to its own cluster than to its neighboring cluster. So <clears throat> what we found was that the scaffold-like algorithm generated slightly higher uh, mean silhouette scores than the, the pod clustering algorithm. Uh, we found that the, that the mean silhouette score for the the scaffold-like algorithm across all databases was 0.59 compared to the POPs, about 0.48. They're both reasonably higher values indicating that you know, these clusters are actually tightly grouped. And the figure here, what you see is the, the comparison of the silhouette scores in human samples. And um, if you notice, uh, the black dots indicate the silhouette scores for uh, the scaffold-like algorithm and the white are for the pop. The, the, the silhouette scores are pretty uh, similar across all databases except for the largest databases, like the Swiss Rock and the Tremble and the Swiss Rock and the Tremble and the Isoforms. And uh, this big separation, we believe, is because of how the PAW and the scaffold-like algorithm are different. Um, 
in the Quora cluster gallery, it uses the unique peptide evidence to see if there's sufficient unique peptide evidence to form a cluster. So it kind of it's more of a uh, algorithm kind of looks into both unique and shared peptide evidence. However, this Calpher like algorithm has a very liberal clustering criteria. All it does is if two proteins have shared this fifty percent of the peptides, then it clusters them together. So it's more of a one size fit all sort of clustering. And so what we believe is that for uh, these larger databases, for these larger oh, there it is. Um, for these larger databases, um, the pop clustering algorithm, we found uh, uh, several clusters that contain the same uh, kind of uh, protein, uh, so contains proteins that come from the same family. So for instance, you could find several MHC uh, clusters, so it's possible that a protein that is present within one MHC cluster could be closely associated with its neighboring cluster, which could be another MHC cluster. So because of that, it probably could be the, the same score values. However, with the scaffold-like algorithm, all the MHC proteins would be in one big cluster. So, and the neighboring cluster would be a completely different, like an IgG um, cluster. So there's less chance that a protein would be uh, from the MHC cluster would be associated with its neighboring uh, IgG cluster. So, and um, in addition to uh, using some inherent features for internal evaluation, we also wanted to look at some external uh, evaluation and to understand if there's any kind of a biological or a functional similarity within these clusters. And for that, we've uh, performed a gene enrichment analysis uh, to see if, again, there is any kind of a, a biological or functional similarity within proteins of a cluster. And so <clears throat> what we've done for every for every protein for every protein um, for every protein cluster, we've obtained all the on trace gene IDs for those proteins within the cluster. And from that we were then able to obtain all the geo terms for both uh, biological process ontologies and the molecular function ontologies. And using a background set, we were then able to identify uh, significantly shared geoterms for those ontologies within that cluster. So what we found was that um, in a majority of clusters that were used for uh, gene enrichment analysis, they had significant geoterms for um, both biological processes and the molecular function ontology. However, we did notice that <clears throat> a lot of clusters had proteins with the same on-trace gene ID or also that some clusters didn't have proteins with an on-trace gene ID. So uh, because of that, we had to implement an in-house rule where only uh, clusters with at least two unique on-trace gene IDs were actually eligible for a gene enrichment analysis. And by doing so, what we found was that only a smaller proportion of all the clusters that were generated were actually used or eligible for gene enrichment analysis. So for instance, uh, only 25% of the clusters uh, were eligible with the human samples uh, with either PAW or the scaffold clustering algorithm. However, what we did notice was that of those eligible clusters, at least 75% of the clusters had significant geoterms for uh, either biological processes or, or molecular function ontology. So it sort of suggests that our clustering algorithms did generate clusters with uh, biological or, or functional relatedness and not just purely based on some peptide uh, grouping. And so here's an example of a simple of, of a gene enrichment analysis. So what, what I have here is a, a, a protein cluster that was generated using the PAW clustering algorithm with the human samples that was searched against the NCBI RepSeq database. So this cluster has three proteins. It was then able to obtain the on-trace gene IDs. There are three unique on-trace gene IDs. Uh, so this would be considered an eligible cluster because you know, it had at least two unique on-trace gene IDs. Um, and um, I was then able to identify all the geo terms associated with those on-trace gene IDs. And for the background set, I used all the proteins that were identified after the protein inference step using the NCBI RevSeq database and got all those uh, all the on-trace gene IDs of those proteins and then the associated geo terms. And I was then able to compute the uncorrected p-values for each geoterm uh, using the Fisher exact test. And then it was uh, much more corrected with the Benjamin hardware method with an FDR restriction of 0.05. So, uh, so uh, 
p, uh, so geoterms with an adjusted p-value of uh, less than 0 0.05 and that are associated with all the members of a cluster are considered significant. And in this example here, um, what I found was that there were seven uh, significantly shared geoterms and um, uh, they're all related to uh, cell division or GTP binding. And if you look at the, the from, or from the protein sessions, we found out that these proteins belong to the GDM alpha 1 cluster and sort of matches with the geoterm definitions that we found in our geoterm analysis. So it kind of tells you how our clusters are actually uh, biologically related. And finally, we also looked at the effect of uh, QIC. Um, with changing protein context. So uh, we've computed, like I said, we've computed, uh, oh, you can see, oh, you can see, in, I'm sorry, you, you can't see the, uh, the equation for the QIC. It's actually the ratio of the unique PSMs out of all the identified PSMs. And, uh, <clears throat> and then once we've com computed the QIC, we were need to compare the dependence of those QIC across protein sequence databases and basic parsimony logic and extended parsimony constraint. So if you notice that, well, you can notice now, but the QIC is actually dependent on the unique PSM. So there are three different scenarios for unique peptides. You can have peptides that are unique to entire protein sequence databases. So these are peptides that are unique to only a single protein entry that is identified from the entire protein sequence database. Or you can have peptides that are unique after the basic parsimony logic. So these are peptides that are unique to the uh, indistinguishable groups or the distinguishable proteins. And then finally, you can have peptides that are unique um, after the extended parsimony clustering. So these would be peptides that are unique to the clusters of beta. <clears throat> so what we found was that the uh, QIC has significantly improved with the extended parsimony clustering in human samples. Um, so the figure here is, shows the QIC with different uh, unique peptide scenarios. The first, this one, uh, so, and, uh, the, these, the first two scenarios are the peptides that are unique to the protein databases and peptides that are unique after the basic parsimony logic uh, across different protein databases. And what we found is that there's a lot of variability in the QIC scores um, in the first two scenarios. The larger or the smaller databases, such as the Swiss fraud database, um, had a much higher QIC compared to the, the smaller databases, such as the Swiss product and the Trump or the Swiss product and the Trump gas database. However, when we uh, implemented the extended parsimony clustering, uh, it negated the effects of the protein sequence databases. There are also much higher QIC values uh, across all databases. Uh, so what we have here is the unique peptides after the clock was we have the unique peptides after the scaffold. So, uh, and if you notice, the mean QIC uh, after the extended parsimony clustering was right around in the point nineties, and uh, the basic parsimony logic is about point seven five, and the ones that are unique to protein database is only about point six three. <coughs> so, again, in summary, the protein sequence databases from uh, different sources uh, produced different protein and uh, peptide characteristics. So, we found that there is a high variability in the non-redundant protein counts and shared peptide proportions in uh, human sequence databases. And uh, we also found similar protein and peptide uh, characteristics in uh, human samples. Um, so <clears throat> the, when we implemented the protein inference with the basic parsimony logic, uh, we found that it yielded protein counts for human samples that are actually dependent on the uh, protein sequence databases. However, when we implemented the uh, extended parsimony clustering in the form of uh, PAW and scaffold-like algorithms, it significantly reduced the, the variability in the protein and uh, peptide characteristics in the human samples. And also the, uh, the extended parsimony clustering has negated the effects of uh, protein sequence databases. Uh, and at the same time, the clusters that were generated uh, from these algorithms were not only grouped based on peptide information, but they also had uh, very similar biological and uh, functional similarity. And um, finally, the mean QIC was uh, significantly higher for uh, human samples with the extended parsimony clustering uh, compared to when the basic parsimony logic was implemented. And at the same time, we also noticed that the, this extension to parsimony logic has actually negated the effects of protein sequence categories on the mean QIC values.
<clears throat> so finally, in conclusion here, um, how do we, uh, how this clustering algorithm be uh, practically used? You know, do you want to use the, the extended parcel and clustering as part of the European processing pipeline, or, or can we use a regular parsimony logic with the simplest protein sequence database? And uh, based on what I have seen so far and what I've showed you, uh, my recommendation is that for uh, protein expression studies in humans and mice, you know, the basic parsimony logic with the Swiss broad database should be sufficient. You know, I showed you that the Swiss broad database has uh, a good balance between completeness and redundancy. So, but however, it's only, the Swiss broad database doesn't contain all the uh, uh, higher eukaryotic organisms. So if you can use uh, non-human, non-mouse uh, higher eukaryotes, then it's uh, recommended that you use a more complete database such as the addition of the thermal database. And when you're going to use a much larger database, then it's recommended that you perform this extended parsimony logic because it can simplify the protein inference list and also can maximize the QLC values. And uh, also, the uh, extended parsimony question should be used as a supplement to the uh, to the basic parsimony if it's not to substitute it. It's only used after. So, however, we did find some limitations in our study. The extended parsimony clustering was uh, tested on only humans and mice, and we don't know its effects on other higher eukaryotic organisms. And at the same time, if we don't know how this extended parsimony clustering would uh, perform when it's applied to sequence databases for samples that were digested with uh, uh, non trypsin proteases. This was only performed on trypsin uh, digested sequence databases for samples. Um, and if you're looking for isoforms, then it's recommended that you not use the uh, pro sequence data, or so the extended parsimony logic, because there's a possibility that all the isoforms would be clustered into one single uh, group. Um, and finally, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, thesis committee, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Will Martin, Dr. Brad, uh, they've been uh, really, really helpful throughout this entire thesis uh, work, and uh, I guess you guys are officially added to my list of God's gifts. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also like to thank Dr. Shannon McQueenie, uh, Diane Doctor, uh, Lynn Schwab, and all my BCP classmates and my professors. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Okay. Um, sure. well, th thanks for the cool talk. Um, good luck. The, the closed door session afterwards. Um, very quickly, actually, two questions. Yes. Um, one, um, do we know um, if a single protein uh, is digested, um, if the actual ratios of peptides end up mapping one to one to one to one? And, 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 if, and if not, then, then how robust is the idea of the parsimony assumptions? And if they are, then, then can you actually decomplement the relative proportions of the protein? That's the first question. And the second question, is can, I mean, on a given cell type, only a portion of the actual transcriptome is going to be available. Um, you may not know up front, but if you actually, rather than taking the entire database, I mean, if you filter down to the subset of proteins that are actually expressed, or genes actually expressed, does that change your results? Okay, to answer your first question, um, we do account for missed cleavages in our protein sequence analysis. So we, we count to two missed cleavages. So it's not necessary in the real biological sample when you apply a personalization that you would see a one to one proportion. So there is. So in the protein sequence analysis, when you perform the peptide identifications, you do account for missed cleavages. Uh, missed, uh, and uh, for your second question, I think, I think one thing that we need to do with the study is to perform the same analysis or you know, on one species on certain species across different cell types. And uh, you know, for right now, uh, all, all we're doing here is comparing the basic parsimony logic to the extended parsimony clustering. But because to get a better idea, you know, we test extended parsimony clustering on human samples with different cell types. Perhaps that could maybe give us a better idea on how this would perform. We have another six minutes for questions. Oh, so, so you were uh, when you were showing differences between uh, human and yeast. Um, you uh, in in protein sequence databases or in real biological samples? Yes, both. 
Okay. okay. The, so I was just curious, and I know you don't have uh, slides for it, but um, did you perform these same analyses on mice? And if so, yes. does it look a lot more like the human? Uh, the protein sequence databases do look a lot more like human, but interestingly, uh, we found that with the mice, the actual identifications don't have as much of a correlation with the protein sequence databases as we expected. Um, I think I think one of the things you're you're seeing here with this difference, as you alluded to, the the biological complexity. There's a lot of differences between uh, human genomes and, and yeast genomes. You know, there, there's a big difference in the size. Yeast uh, have actually a whole lot fewer introns. Okay. Um, then, the, the, depending on the papers you read, they either say they don't have introns, or there's just a subset of genes that have introns. But you can imagine, without introns, you're going to really affect how many different isoforms you have, which in right. turn is going to impact analyses where your shotgun proteomics is going to just give a different sort of uh, pattern there. But I would imagine the mice, the differences you're seeing between the mice and the human, I'm guessing it probably has more to do with how well curated the databases are for mice versus humans. That's possible, and also it could be that the the alternate forms, so whether they're cryptonites, are harder to identify. Yeah, that, yeah. So I think I think you you sort of you've got real biological differences between these organisms, but you've also got sort of database and just how much manpower has been dumped into characterizing those. Thank you. Yes. Did you uh, look at the effect of um, uh, unique uh, peptide count as far as uh, how many unique peptides were required to identify a particular one versus two? Uh, identify a particular, sorry. Uh, how many uh, unique peptides did you require in order to identify a protein? Um, oh, uh, the protein uh, Well, one of the parts of the principles is a two peptide uh, match. So, in order to identify protein, you should have at least two distinct peptides. So, that was the, the minimum criteria. So, so, all your data was generated with the two peptides. Two peptide rule and also the substance and complicated. Two distinct peptides. And yes, they won't necessarily have to be unique to that. How long were your peptides? Was there like a minimum? Seven, to, uh, seven, seven and above. Seven so and the minimum above. size of a peptide is amino acids. Seven amino acids. And so theoretically, these peptides were just random slices out of the full length of your protein. Not really random. Where no. there, there's an RTN and lysine residue. Okay. Because of the trips. The digestion. Yeah, exactly. that's right. Okay. Okay. But, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. What effect do you think the uh, QIC uh, value would have if uh, you're doing like a TMT based experiment where quantitation proteins? Um the the QIC it's uh, I, from what I read. It's it's a label-free method, so it's uh, TMP would be more for. I may be wrong because I don't I don't have as much uh, experience with the, the TMP labeling stuff. But I'm just looking for TMP for uh, absolute quantification. Uh, whereas this QIC is only the relative quantification. Uh, again, I, I might be wrong because I don't have as much experience uh, with that part. Which clustering algorithm do you think works better? Uh, <clears throat> if you are looking at straight up results, they're both equally good, and you know they're they they they're both completely reduce the variability uh, in protein counts and also in shape and proportions. Um, it it doesn't really matter, but but here's the thing: the pod may be a little more because it's actually using the unique peptide evidence, seeing if there's enough unique peptide evidence to, to have this two proteins clustered together. But to be on the uh, scaffold, it's a very, uh, sorry, I won't call it elementary, but a very simple, very difficult. So 
um, you could use either depending on what your interests are. If you're, if you're planning on shrinking your protein uh, inference list even smaller, then perhaps use these now because all the large protein clusters or all the, all the similar proteins would be one big cluster compared to the scaffold computing form. Yes? Why did you choose the variability as kind of the endpoint for the quality of the, um, the clustering in your approach? Um, well, all I wanted to show here is that with the basic parsimony logic, there is, I mean, I, I have a correlation plot, so I just don't have it here. Uh, so I, I have a correlation plot compared to the uh, protein uh, counts. Um, the protein, yeah, the protein counts and the protein sequence analysis compared to what we've identified. And with the basic question of life, there's a nice you know, positive correlation uh, between again, the identified proteins and the protein sequence analysis. But since I'm just looking at how the how the clustering algorithm uh, negates the effects of protein sequence analysis, I thought perhaps I mentioned the very good should be a solution. And then I'm actually performing F test on that to see how significant. It's more of a variance. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for attendance. And uh, this will conclude. And, uh, and we'll go on to the elimination uh, part. Thank you. Thank you. Shuffling all sequence, or just like uh, keeping K's and R's invariant, shuffling right, just the peptides, right. or Markov chain models, right. and all of that. Lots of trouble. <laughs> that got kind of abandoned early on. So, why do you think that was? What was the problem with, with trying to randomize your, your protein sequences if you're going to make a decoy database? Although, I think, I think when you're randomizing, it's a possibility that it could match. Target uh, effect sequence. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for randomizing an entire uh, protein sequence, then I think it's, it's more uh, computation seems to be the just randomizing. If you do seven amino acids or more, there's a chance that uh, then you have palindromic things almost zero. So it's, it's not the fact that you, you might get a target protein if you randomize. It's something else. Think, think about the, the peptide characteristics here. If you've got a big database, right. are most of your peptides different in your real sequences? Or are most of them the same? No. It depends on the organism. Let's say you had a, a higher human. That's, that's what we always prefer to study. Uh, well, my data here, if you 
50 percent or so. No, no, they should most of them be different. Uh, oh, 50 percent are shared peptides, so meaning that the same peptide is actually present in several protein sequences. So, right, but your copy count is, is not included in, in that way of counting. And you're talking about like 3 million um, tryptic peptides from the big database. That's a non redundant count. That's like 11 million if it's oh, a whole thing. Right. So, so, are most of your peptides different or are most of your peptides the same? It's not exactly a well formed question. What do you mean most of them are different? Do you mean unique? That they only appear in one protein, or they only appear in one place. Well, when you do tryptic digestion, your target proteins. How how often are they the same peptide in one of these like human from a different database. from a different location in the in the, in the genome? Okay. Are you are, are a lot of the peptides going to be the same and match to multiple proteins, or is that going to be rare? Uh, I would think there would be other proteins that match the same, protein, not not peptides that match the same protein. Um, multiple. Multiple points, sorry, multiple points. Because of the isoforms and it's just the human uh, genomic uh, context. And there are motifs, right? And motifs are exactly that. So now, if you randomize everything, mm -hmm. do you think that situation is still going to be true? It's still, no, oh, no, it's, it's, no, because that would not be true. Right. So, would your number decoy database uh, entry? Uh, Decoy triptic peptides perhaps no longer match your target. Oh, you triptic want them to peptides. have a one to one uh, relationship between the target and the decoy. So, if you do that, they're, they're completely balanced and the FDR ratios will be. What would you want to do with your decoy? This is an interesting question you're posing because cause it's, it's like one of those few interesting questions where a simple answer is kind of like one of the better answers. What are all the properties that you want of the decoy database? Um, right? I mean, You want the decoy database to look like the protein database along they, some measures, right? What are those measures? They need to be, they need to have the same length distribution, I would assume, uh, as the target uh, yeah. database, and uh, equal number. So if you have 1,000 uh, decoy database, you want to have mm -hmm. a similar number. And yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. And you already talked about you want the same amount of redundancy. You want the same proportion of amino acids. Right? Correct. Well, so you probably want the same cleavage as well. Well, well anyway, if you're doing high mass accuracy, you need to worry about if it's the same mass or not. Same mass, exactly. But if we're going to mask IRL, oh, it's only for an IRL scenario. But yes, same mass should also be. So how might you make a, a randomized database that, that matched your target? How might you make a randomized? I mean, the reversing is kind of a nice, simple way that that the thing does it right. for you. And right. then you can, like, if you're worried about K and R conversions, which happen about 50% of the time, then, then you've got just one little complication to, right. to do if you want isobaric relationship to be one-to-one. -one. I mean, isn't randomized the most, not randomized, isn't uh, flipping them the uh, most uh, common method? Of creating a decoy? Yeah, but what if, you're, what if you wanted to, to do a test against a decoy database 10 times? You've only got one way to make a reverse database. In that case, you would use multiple testing. So you do a, uh, you would test it. You would calculate an FDR for every time, and then you would do a more raw FDR. Uh, that work? I mean, depending on the number of tests you perform. Or the situation like yeast, your decoy database is, is not big enough to provide a, a proper challenge against incorrect matches to your target database. You're, you're looking at six or seven thousand sequences in the thing in, in, a, in a state of the art experiment. You can identify four or five thousand proteins. That's almost all of your target database. So you don't really have a very big source of distraction when you've only got seven thousand decoy sequences. Maybe you want ten times as many decoy sequences. How as would you target. make? How would you make, you know, ten yeast decoy databases that all have the same properties but are all different? Um, wow. Um, well, you would 
I never thought about this either. So <laughs> it might be a good thing to think about in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, really. Your outcome here probably doesn't depend on this. No, but, but if, if there's no baseball <laughs> game on. But if you have these peptides, you can you can generate a, one set of uh, decoy uh, database, and then with the peptides that you had generated in the decoy database, couldn't you shuffle each uh, amino acid within that peptide so that you know you would still have the same molecular mass? That. So, so what I mean by that is, so let's say let's say you have a, a, a decoy database here, uh, and and what you can do is within each peptide in the decoy database, you can shuffle this peptide here so that uh, another peptide in the second decoy database would have the same um, protein sequence or so same amino acid sequence as this uh, peptide. However, there is a chance that this shuffled, uh, reshuffled uh, decoy database could match with the target database. That, that, that's yeah. a possibility. That, that does happen, and that's not really um, you, when, you, when you did theoretical digests of, of things and counted stuff, what data structure in Python did you use to keep track of things? Oh, I, I've uh, used the, the, the dictionary and the sets. All right, so if you, if you digest a protein, you know, just digest all your proteins, and you make a dictionary of peptides, what could you then do with that dictionary of peptides in terms of making decoys? You could reverse them. You could shuffle. shuffle them. And then you could put the decoys back together. 